next talk we have for test driven development with NSWill by Pooja. And info about her is like Pooja is an application developer in Roadrunner and has been developing software in Ruby on Rails and Python Django based web app. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for attending the talk. Uh, and I, in turn, I'll just try and do justice to all the caffeine that you have inside you, not put you back to the sleep. A uh, little bit about myself. Uh, I'm currently working with Roadrunner. Uh, this is a pretty new startup, uh, six months old, based out of Bangalore. Uh, it is into hyperlocal delivery. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard about it. Uh, prior to that, I was working with ThoughtWorks for last three years, uh, mostly engaged into developing web apps based on Ruby on Rails and Python Django. Uh, also, I've been doing on and off DevOps work, and today, uh, presenting on the same, uh, how to test drive your infrastructure. Uh, because uh, I think mostly, uh, in most of the agile conferences here and there, a lot of, uh, lot of talks we receive on how to, what are the best practices around application code, or uh, what are the, uh, why do we need test-driven development, or why do we need continuous delivery, and all that focuses around your app code. But what about your infrastructure code? So, so that is what I'll be presenting uh, today. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. I would be happy to receive any feedback or opinions on this. Uh, all right, so, so again, to start with test-driven development, uh, how many of you ha uh, have been using this on a regular basis? Okay, okay. Uh, just to, just to brief uh, about the concept, uh, it's a simple concept, right? So it's for developers where the feedback cycle is faster. Uh, so w before any upcoming feature, you just start uh, writing tests for that feature. You test the required behavior from that feature. You, you run the test and see those tests failing. Then you, then you implement the feature and see it pass so as to know what your uh, feature is exactly supposed to do. Uh, what are the benefits? Straightforward, right? So re receive your failing feedback faster and not late into production or any other uh, pre-live environments. Uh, to, to, to give you uh, clean code, to, give, to improve your overall design. Um, and, and, and I think, uh, so this is just my personal opinion. Uh, uh, along with all these benefits, it has also some, in a way, helped us in the continuous delivery process of application development, right? So, so to to define or to just explain the regular flow path of how app code gets deployed to the production, uh, that's a developer uh, pushing his code from his local machine uh, to some version control system, um, and from there, there's a CI server sitting and pulling this code uh, on and off, and. Uh, and this CI server enforces some practice uh, running the test around the around the artifact that has that it has just pulled. Uh, if those tests fail, right, that artifact is rejected and not pushed to production. But when it passes, uh, it goes through series of servers and environments and finally pushed to production. Um, right? This is how it goes. Right? Okay. Uh, but when it comes to designing infrastructure. Uh, the usual life cycle begins with uh, bootstrapping a server manually, right? I, I want to develop an application which is on Ruby on Rails and which needs Nginx server and which needs uh, MySQL as a database. All right, create, create a server, spin up all this, uh, uh, install all these things on the server and get my uh, thing running on some environment. Some environment, I'm not calling it production yet. And then image the same box into multiple servers, and then build up what is then so called as production environment. Uh, why? Why it is done so? Right? Traditionally, uh, infrastructure has been lagged far behind all these development practices in terms of CI, in terms of code quality, in terms of uh, in terms of testing per se. Uh, but but I think thanks to community, when it when the realization hit them, uh, there was ev evolution of the provisioning tools like Ansible, Chef, Puppet. And uh, and I am to say here that it did make the life simpler, uh, rather than just going and uh, installing things manually, and then uh, then thinking about what did I install and what what I need next if I want to just duplicate the environment. Uh, this gives an automation uh, script where you have where you have a proper set of knowledge that what I need on my server. So Ansible and all these provisioning tools made the life simpler, but but after uh, after this was introduced. Uh, what is the flow path of infrastructure change? I'm not saying the this bootstrapping. So it's now your server has been bootstrapped, and now you want to add some change to the production environment. How does that infrastructure change is deployed to production? 
it goes somewhat like this. So a developer just sits on his machine, pushes the code to the to the uh, version control system, and from there it goes uh, to production. Uh, many of uh, many of you will disagree, saying that no, we we do test it manually on some, some pre-live environments because we don't want to screw up the production environment. Right, we do. But then, uh, but then how many times uh, we are confident about a simple change and there exists a syntactical error and unable to start your server, right? Uh, how, and, and this is just a smaller picture sitting, having one developer and one production server. Think of this and sc scale it to multiple servers having in a distributed environment where there are multiple devs sitting. Can you enforce each and everybody to just test the, their infrastructure change? No, right? There needs to be some tooling that enforces certain practices in this deployment process. However, first I would like to give you the demo of how things break on production. Okay, so. So this is a uh, static page that I have served on an e Nginx server. And uh, this is what I've deployed on a, a Vagrant. I've automated it via an Ansible script. So now to give you the uh, code sample, this is my bootstrap script, uh, bootstrapping script where I have an Nginx server. And I'm copying certain configs into that. The configs here being there is one server listening on port 80. All I have to change now is to deploy another application on another port. Right, so I have already done this, so I'm just gonna check out another branch. All right, and then I'm gonna apply the Ansible playbook again on, uh, just a prior question, how many of you have worked in with Ansible before? Uh, for others, just a quick quick introduction, Ansible uh, is, is nothing, it just, gets set of instructions and installs whatever you are uh, asking to install on a particular environment. That's all. So, so to show you here, um, so when, when I say the task, those are just the simple tasks that it will run on, on a particular host. Those are the tasks that I'm going to run on, on my Vagrant machine right now after applying this. I'm sorry, this is just a dynamic IP thing. Right. Right. So, so it ran set of tasks. Uh, you see the nginx copy config has been changed, which means there is some change in nginx config, which also triggered the nginx restart. So, it restarted the nginx, and the output shows that everything went through, which means now my environment should be up, and I should be able to have two applications, one deployed, which was earlier on port 80, and the other one, which I just just added. I deployed it on port 3000. Uh, all of this is port forwarded to the host machine. I'm just going to refresh the previous application. And now it's no more there. I'm testing whether the new one got deployed. I'm port forwarding it to a 9000. And there's something else. There's no application deployed there, right? So, so when you see here, basically there was something else running on my port 3000, but none of the script told me so, right? So, so s consider this scenario and, and changing uh, or adding something on a new port is just a simplistic example, but it did make your Nginx stop, right? Uh, so, so now consider coming back to my presentation. Now consider uh, th there were tests around this, uh, and and I had run those tests on my uh, local environment, and and that would have given me a failure, saying no, this particular change is not ready to go on production, and something will go wrong. Let's, let's just say something, and the test is not giving you feedback that what it is, uh, what is exactly going wrong on the server. So, so would that help a little bit, right? Uh, so, so I started thinking in those direction. Uh, I had spent a lot of time do, uh, developing application code, and that's why while when I moved to infrastructure, I started thinking in the same lines. So, uh, so I started uh, reading about uh, can we can I write tests for my infrastructure code, and there I. Um, there I learned about this term, test-driven infrastructure. So, uh, so uh, okay. So when you, uh, there are five principles basically that define the infrastructure uh, testing, uh, and those five principles being 
one to document all your system requirements have a high level uh, system requirements uh, written somewhere so that you know what behavior is expected out of your system once you know what the what is the system ex is expected to be uh, like then you write test around that behavior right so do i have uh, so for example right so uh, i know that in a production my production environment will look like there will be two app servers and there will be a there will be a mysql server running so basic behavior will be both the app server should be up mysql server should be up and all this server should be able to talk to to uh, to themselves among themselves right so this is the si si simple system behavior that i'm setting up S run those tests see them failing and then you implement actual infrastructure code to bring those environments up to bring those servers up and then see them having those behavior uh, uh, being implemented and when you see that uh, you run your test and you see them passing also obviously so you version your infrastructure code because uh, like always right it gives you easy collaboration the the most important point is to do this continuously right because uh, if you compare the frequency of application code being deployed versus infrastructure code being deployed you would say there is no need right because i i probably deploy an infrastructure change once in two months now consider the probability of application code breaking your uh, breaking your production environment versus your infrastructure code be breaking your environment the percentage is probably high so so i would say th there is need of doing this continuously so that you enforce the practices which will going forward which going forward will all obviously give a safer environment um, for for this development as well uh okay so so now when i uh, read about this this all principles and everything in theory it looked fine what about implementing them so i started writing tests around my ansible scripts uh this is my ansible playbook uh, where uh, i'm just copying the nginx configuration from a template file to the on the remote host uh so how do i test this so i started thinking on uh, can i have a uh, test around whether the file is being copied or uh, whether the file contains proper root whether the file contains uh, application being deployed on so and so port right and that's how i wrote my test so my test look like this particular thing should be a file this file should contain so and so text so that when so whenever someone changed this particular line it will fail what if someone adds something new it won't right so which means then you have to test drive your uh, infrastructure where you have to add a test before you add a file does that make sense to me it did but not much because i'm not testing the higher level behavior i'm not I, so testing if this file contains blah 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 will give me certain assurance that if it changes if my project root changes it will show me but will it give me error like what i did will it give me error when i started something on a new port and there was existing something this won't right so uh, so i started doing research around this and uh, there is a uh, there is a big google group discussion around uh, how to whether we should test drive your ansible or not uh, why specifically around ansible uh, all of us know that it's a very declarative language uh unlike chef and puppet which claims themselves as an as a very uh, declarative one ansible has just gone beyond limits uh, uh sh with with puppet it, i have worked with puppet i haven't worked with chef but with puppet there is some there is some logic in your code with ansible it's plain simple so when i'm testing the 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 way i did before i'm doing nothing but testing ansible modules and i don't want to test because i trust the community so when i read those uh, google group discussion something which really uh, caught my eyes was this line uh, i don't want to test what what it is being implemented but i want to test the outcome of this right if i do a particular thing what it will result into this is something that i want to test and 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 so these questions were right that can i ping this particular website is my server up are the servers able to talk to each other and not this right so uh, so in the same thing i also uh, came across server spec uh, have you heard of this okay so so server spec is a ruby library which gives you a way to test the system uh, behavior uh, it's a simple r spec matches but uh, not for your application code where you just say one expect one is equal to one 
it it gives you matches like expect uh, a particular port is listening expect a particular uh, uh, expect a particular so when i do a call a particular output is received and and this this way so uh, so i started writing uh, server spec for my implementation so to to just show you a bit of code so this is how the sample uh, spec file would look like uh, it it just tests whether port 80 is listening or not uh, and and uh, when i do a curl on that what is the output and when i added the new um, when i added the new app being deployed on port 3000 i also added this test so so from the implement from the demo pre, uh, before this uh, you would remember that it failed right the port 3000 was listening but there was something else running on it so now when i run my specs on my local machine All right, those failed. So, so if you look at this further, it will tell me that uh, the unit test that I wrote is fine. That particular thing is file and it has this particular root. But when I say, is port 80 listening? No. Uh, when I do uh, lo curl local host on 80, it's failing. But port 3000 is listening. So in a way, my tests are telling me that something change that you made is exactly not uh, is exactly failing because there is something else running on port 3000, right? So so if you read read the failure uh, well, and if you understand how server spec behaves and what what exact behavior are you expecting out of your uh, environment, I think those can give you a proper feedback in a way rather than having no test around your infrastructure. So, uh, so I started my talk with test-driven development, where, where a test is written first for a feature, then it's developed and deployed to production, which looks like this. Uh, for infrastructure, I would say the sequence won't matter as long as everything is tested. So I personally was fine if these two swapped. If, if I develop the code first, and then I test that the behavior is still intact. And then the easiest thing, or the main thing for me, to, to get the code deployed to the production environment. Somewhat look like this. A person changing some infrastructure code and pushing it to the, to the version control was pulled by CI. CI running server spec on a Vagrant machine, right? So, so this Vagrant machine was introduced just for so solely for the purpose of testing it, pr testing it and being it production-like. Right, so uh, so at the end, what I'm expecting of my production server should be uh, exactly replicated on this Vagrant box. If it fails, it fails. You don't have to push this to to the production because you don't want your production to to just go down. And if it passes, it gives a fair amount of confidence that whatever I did uh, was at least right because it was tested. If it failed, maybe it was some something due to the hardware failure. Maybe it was because of a network failure. But but a developer can say that I did it, and I know that my code doesn't break. As a developer, you would not want anything less, do you? So why Vagrant? Uh, why not run it against any environment? Why not run it against UAT or staging, right? As as we do now manually. Uh, test it against a, a running environment and, and see it. If it passes it, pu push it to the production. Do you really want to uh, mess up your environment and then revert your changes and apply it again? If you have something, virtualization at your hand, why not use it? Uh, it, it does give CI to enforce certain practices around, uh, around your deployment and delivery process. Uh, where, where it ensures that the, the set of tests are run against some, some server. And it knows that it will pass. More than that, it also gives liberty to any developer just spin up a Vagrant box on his local machine and see it, his changes are working fine. Why to wait for CI to tell you that? right? So, so I think uh, as long as you get the feedback faster in cycle, 
uh, I am fine with with Vagrant being spinned up by a CI server or any any local developer writing his code there. A uh, little bit to talk about server spec. Uh, as I said earlier, it's a, it's a simple uh, Ruby library and having R spec like matches. Uh, if you haven't looked at it, I would really suggest to to have a look at it. It's worth uh, looking at. Uh, even if you have not even uh, automated your servers using any provisioning tools, uh, it's not too late to just try testing it, its behavior. Because if it fails, it will it will let you know right away that it's not uh, working. So I did all of this, and uh, and and all my work was just just screwed by these two terms, Kitchen and Ansible. Uh, which does exactly same what I told. So I did everything manually, and then this particular gem does everything what I told. Uh, it it has uh, it takes an Ansible playbook as input. Uh, it runs that Ansible playbook on on a pro on a platform. It can be Vagrant, it can be Docker, anything, and then it uh, then it runs set of tests on that particular platform, which is what I just did, right? And uh, it's a YAML file, right? So it it everything to configure here is just in three blocks. One is you give your provisioner, right? So that's the name of the playbook that you want to apply. Those are the host where you want to apply it. That's my provider. So it's a Vagrant box. It's an Ubuntu, and and set of configurations ag around it which you want to just uh, which are just optional, and then. It takes a block where you just give set name of your test file. Test file is nothing but it could be any any test that you want. It could be a um, server spec. It could be a YAML test. It could be anything. It just takes the block and run that test file. And and it just uh, yeah. So I think uh, Kitchen Ansible uh, was something which just uh, which just uh, made everything easy like a breeze. Uh, to talk about why should we do the test-driven infrastructure, right? What are the benefits of doing this? Uh, pretty much all the previous slides cover this, uh, but just to just to sum it up, it will give you readily verifier behavior, uh, which means I I do some change on my local machine. I want to verify it right away. I don't want to apply it to any environment and see that. So that that gives uh, this is available at hand. You can fail fast and not worry about it. You can improve your overall architecture. And the major one, you can always, always do refactoring without worrying what will break. Awesome. So so everything is done. I've set up my server. I've written Ansible script. I've tested it. And everything works fine. Uh, so I have four nodes now, and all of them are being tested. What if one of the node goes down? Not because of any of this. It goes down because there was a network failure. It goes down because there was low disk space. So it's always suggested to have some sort of uh, net, some sort of system monitoring around this. Uh, there are a lot of tools available at hand. There is uh, Monit, there is Nginx, uh, sorry, Nagios, there is uh, uh, New Relic for that matter. But uh, but yeah, every team uh, ensures that this is in place, and uh, and they should. Taking the opportunity of this, I would like to uh, just, just share the knowledge which I came across while doing this presentation. This is a new tool that has been introduced uh, a couple of days ago. It's called Auto. Uh, they claim it as being a uh, successor of Vagrant. Uh, so it not only knows how to develop your application, it also knows how to deploy it. Uh, around this, they've developed with uh, your, um, OK, so they've developed uh, with Dependencies being your first-class feature, so you just you just name that my app my code or the application that I'm developing is a Ruby application, and it it installs all sort of dependencies that it needs. So it's it's having worth a look at. It's very new, but uh, but it's stable. I'm I'm giving it a try right now. All right, thanks. It's going to provision your Vagrant or Docker and then run set of tests around it. So it's not going to mock it. It's actual implementation on a Vagrant box on a virtual environment. Right, so so if if you're doing it locally, uh, you may or may not. But for CI, I would suggest uh, not doing it is uh, is better because then you have your v one server running always like production, but there's no test, there's no uh, application test around it. So you always have that vagrant environment up, 
and run set of tests around it. But you, but if it goes down, nothing is to harm, right? Right. No, you just, you just either you revert your changes and apply it again, or you just, uh, yeah, or you recreate. But I think if reverting works, then you don't have to recreate, right? Not by the system. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a good question. Uh, that that was continuously on my mind when when I was working on it. Uh, so so I think uh, as I, as I gave the example, having unit tests around your infrastructure code uh, does not really s uh, make help you having reaching the uh, ultimate goal, re uh, testing the actual behavior. I could test that particular template file contains this. I could test that my particular server is being installed. I could test my particular package is being installed. But but uh, but that would just mean I'm testing my playbook, and it will exactly look my infra as look like as my infrastructure provision file. Uh, versus if you if you have a system level test, which means system level test will test the system behavior. It will only come in place when you have the system running. So you have to develop first. You have to deploy it on an environment and then test the system behavior. Okay, so I'm not going against unit tests. I'm just saying it doesn't make it. Do, it is not relevant in case of infrastructure uh, development. Okay. Uh, from your experience, what do you see are the limitations of test-driven infrastructure? Uh, okay, uh, as I said, right. So, I I did not go for testing with Puppet, uh, but I I did with Ansible and and my test look exactly like the playbook. Uh, to me, when I was writing test first, I, I felt like I'm writing the playbook itself. Uh, one is that. Two is uh, infrastructure uh, is about spinning up a server. So uh, you won't be able to test a lot of things unless it's implemented on a particular environment. Uh, that is that is the biggest limitation, because you can, you can test that a particular uh, thing has been written, but you cannot implement it. It has been installed unless it is actually installed. Or you have to mock it. Uh, so, so those are the limitations that I faced. Yeah, hi. I worked on Puppet, so could you just give me a um, brief on what's the difference between Puppet and Ansible? I mean, um, in terms of so writing test cases as well as in terms of structure of the code. Okay. So, how how different is it, and how uh, hard is it to learn? Okay, so uh, I did not uh, work on testing the Puppet uh, thing. I was only uh, looking at developing it. Uh, to me, it uh, one, it's a Ruby file. It's not a YAML, right? So, so there are functions, there are uh, passing of variables around. Uh, with Ansible, it's a YAML file. So, there's a hierarchy defined there. Uh, that's the bigger one in terms of how it looks. Uh, in terms of implementation, also, I think it's pretty much same. It works on roles and host and everything. So, the implementation doesn't change. Uh, mostly, uh, also s since it's function in the puppet, it gives you liberty to write your logic there. With Ansible, there are no functions. So you have to use existing modules, or you can create your custom modules. Hi, uh, how, would you, how, how would you uh, 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 test drive a, uh, a cloud infrastructure, uh, such as uh, AWS, uh, which uses uh, simply email service, uh, a queue service, uh, and uh, S3, uh, which are, you know, which have been, uh, which have been uh, spinned up uh, from, uh, from uh, the API? From the from the from the Amazon uh, client. Okay, okay. Yeah. So 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 to understand your question better, how do you test in case of uh, something like AWS, where you where you spin up from the from from the AWS portal and don't write script for it? Ah yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I I never came across that scenario. Uh, but but yeah, I I would just think that whatever is expected out of your end system should be. Uh, should be replicated somewhere and tested. So if you have to uh, have some something with AWS, if you are uh, spinning up with, with AWS users, uh, know your system requirements first and, and have that system behavior replicated in a vagrant environment or in any virtual environment and test it first and then you s create your production environment. So just to add to the limitations part, so one of the challenges that I see is that, yeah, it fine, runs fine on Vagrant and Docker, but if you go to AWS or, or EC2 instances, you have another layer called routing. The boxes are different. You could still be running Docker, 
but then you have another element of routing and all that. So you don't actually uh, get the same environment in production that you can do it locally. There are, there are quite yeah. quite a large number of differences between what you do on your system and yeah. what you do in AWS. Yeah, I I agree with that, uh, and uh, but but I think uh, somewhere it has to start, right? So why not we we start doing testing whatever is present at hand, and then uh, then actually talking about the limitation in open forums, where then it it the where then the community can take it forward, or we ourselves can take it forward to to write something around it, to to make it production like, and to have something virtual av available which can be exactly replicated as production thing. Other questions? Nothing. Okay. Oh, one question I want to ask. Yeah. Uh, I've been using Vagrant uh, for uh, this. Uh, Serving uh, like uh, IPython and Apache Spark. So, like, say if I use like, uh, Oto, I have to write code on Ruby or Python. Sorry, your application is in Python. Yeah, application is Python, but uh, Vagrant uh, allows uh, Ruby only, right? So right. Uh, writing a, a Vagrant file, you, you, need, you need to know yeah, yeah, Ruby, yeah. right? Yeah, so Oto has Oto file where you just, uh, uh, so it's, it's again very declarative. It's something like Ansible. So, you just say my app type is Python, right? So, uh, so have a look at it. It's Ruby. But uh, it's it's again much declarative than what Vagrant was. 